Good morning. Good morning. There's a few people over here who heard me. Good morning. I grew up in a family with six kids, so I had five other siblings uh, and then myself making the sixth kid. And when you have that many kids in one household at one time, um, you need to have a certain set of rules that apply. Otherwise, things get out of hand really quick. Chaos ensues with, with six kids. So we had a set of rules in our household that we had to kind of go by, not any different than most people. Uh, for instance, one of our rules that we had was on a school night, every night, didn't matter uh, what you said or what you did, you had to be in bed by nine o'clock on a school night. It was just, it was the law of the land. Weekends, we could stay up to like 10.30 or something like that. But the school night, we had to be in bed by nine. Also, if we were to eat even the smallest bit of food off of our plates before we prayed at dinner time, my dad would force us to wait two minutes before we would eat. And I'm telling you, as an eight-year-old kid, two minutes is an eternity. I'm sitting here watching my siblings eat while I'm starving over here, and I got to wait two whole minutes. But the rule that got broken the most at our household was the rule, don't throw the football in the house. And for whatever reason, I was the one who broke that rule most often. But don't throw the football in the house. And there was one day in particular where my parents were gone and it was just us kids at home. And for whatever reason, I had the football in the house and I was just kind of throwing it up and down lazily, just throwing it up and down, catching it, throwing it up in the air again. And I was in the kitchen and in the kitchen right next to the pantry on the wall, there's a plate. And this plate, you guys see where this is going already, all right. You see this plate, it was a hand-painted plate given to my parents on their wedding day. It was over, and at this point, it was over 20 years old. Um, so I'm throwing the football up and down lazily. I lose control of the football. It hits the plate, and it almost happens like it's in slow motion. You ever have like one of those cartoon effects happen? It happens in slow motion, and it falls to the ground, shatters into a billion pieces, and I'm sitting here looking at it in disbelief like, oh, Lord. Just a million pieces. And the only other person who was in the kitchen at the time was my sister, Jessie. And I looked over at my sister, and she didn't even have to say anything. She looked me in the eyes, and I knew what she was thinking in her head. You're dead. <laughs> You're dead. I'm like, I know. You don't have to tell me that. I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm like, you know what? I lived a good life. It was great while it lasted. I start getting my finances in order so I can read. I, I'm trying to get things set. I'm dead. I'm not going to see the next day. And I was so upset that I broke the plate, that I sent myself to my room. I'm like, go to your room. I'm like, okay, I'm going to my room. So I went to my room and I sat in my room by myself waiting for my parents to get home. And if you ever had that happen, we're just waiting for mom and dad to get home knowing you're gonna get busted when, you get, when they get home. It's a terrible feeling. But I felt so bad, not because I necessarily broke the plate. I didn't really care about the plate, uh, if I'm honest. This wasn't because I broke the plate, it's because I broke the rules, and because I broke the rules, the plate was shattered, and I knew I was going to get in trouble. So I was waiting in my room for my mom, and I, it turned hours went on end, and I ended up falling asleep. And my mom was so, um, she was so upset that I felt so upset that she didn't even get me in trouble. So I got off on it. So, but from that moment on, after that near-death experience, as I would say, I decided I was no longer going to throw the football in the house. I was going to follow the rules at least for another week or so until mom forgot about what I did. But we're looking at a story and, uh, from a perspective of a man named Matthew who recorded a series of conversations that Jesus is having with a group of religious leaders in his day. And they're called the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And these groups of people, these religious leaders, were really, really, really good at following the rules. They were really, really good at following the law of God. In fact, they were known for having memorized and known by heart all 613 commandments from God. And then they added some afterwards to make it even better, apparently. And they were uh, known to keep all of these rules and to hold everybody accountable for these rules. And they considered themselves to be pure of heart and to love God so much that they followed everything that he had to say. And they were known for being these people who were diligent at following after God. However... These people were also known to treat people who were not good at following the rules or who were different than them or had less than them extremely poorly. 
and they would put themselves on a pedestal. They were extremely self-righteous. They would look at others and who were not as good as them, and they would look down on them, and they would belittle them. They thought that they were better than these people. So Jesus is having a conversation with these people. And in fact, they're repeating question after question after question after question to Jesus in an attempt to prove that they know more about the law. And if they could trip Jesus up in his words, they could prove that he's not actually from God. So they're going time after time after time again, asking him a question, asking him a question. And Jesus is nailing every single one. He's answering it perfectly. But they still keep coming with questions. They're swinging away and they're striking out more than the Yankees in October. And they're just going and going and going. <laughs> Boston fans are like, yeah. But Jesus is answering every single one of these questions perfectly until finally they come up with one last question. And it says a lawyer, someone who knew the law really well, came up to Jesus and asked him a question. This, Matthew records this in Matthew chapter 22, uh, verse 34. It says this. Oop. Hearing that Jesus had silent the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So this final leader comes up to Jesus, and he asks him this question, Jesus, what is the greatest, most important commandment that you guys have ever given? What is the most important commandment? And at first, it seems like a pretty good question, right? That's a good question to ask, because here's the thing. I want to make sure that I'm following this all correctly, like that I'm following after God, that I'm loving God to the best of my ability, but if I don't have the greatest commandment of all time pinned down, then, then I'm not doing a good job. So what is the greatest commandment that I have to be extra good at, that I have to be better at than most people? Or what is the one commandment that I can't break? Because if I do break it, then I'm not right with God, I'm not following God, and I'm not loving God correctly. Jesus, what is the most important commandment? And Jesus replies back in a very strange way almost. He replies back and he says this. The first and greatest commandment is this. Love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your heart. And I have to imagine, at this point, this man must have been relieved. He's like, perfect. I've been doing this my whole life. Nobody follows the rules better than me. Nobody loves God more than me. Nobody strives after God more than me. No one has dedicated their entire lives to God more than I have. This is perfect. I've been right all along. But Jesus stops and he goes, wait, there's a second one. He says, the second commandment is like it. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. As for one commandment, Jesus, he gave me two, one at a time. Let's slow it down here, Jesus. You, I asked for one. You're saying there's two greatest commandments, and he says the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. What Jesus is saying is you can't separate these two things. That loving God and loving your neighbor go hand in hand. They go side by side. You don't get to choose to love God and not love people. And you don't get to choose to love people and not love God. It isn't an option. You have to love God. And by doing so, you have to love your neighbor. The two things go hand in hand. They are the most important commandment ever given. And he says these things are going side by side. You can't separate one from the other. And we look at this, and maybe, maybe we've heard this a hundred times. Maybe this is your first time in a church ever. Maybe you don't follow Jesus yet, and this is the first time you've heard this. But it seems pretty basic, right? Like, even if you don't follow Jesus, if you're in this room, you don't follow Jesus, and maybe you know a little bit about him, you know that Jesus is pretty much about love, right? Like, that's kind of his thing. It's like his trademark. He's about love. He loves people. He heals people. He forgives people. He gives generously to people. He's about love. So it seems... Pretty basic. But this is a really, really significant commandment. This is a really big statement because based on this new commandment, the Pharisees who had dedicated their entire lives to God are guilty of not loving the very God they've dedicated to. 
The God they have spent years and years and years studying and following the rules and, and living up to the standard, they are guilty of not loving the same God that they had dedicated their whole lives to. And that flips the world upside down. And that's challenging for us too, isn't it? That's challenging for us. Because Jesus is saying, don't claim to adhere to commandment one if, you can't, uh, if you're guilty of violating commandment two. It's impossible to love God and not love other people. And this is extremely challenging for us as well. And here's, here's why this is important. I get asked this all the time uh, with teenagers or with college students who are going into college or coming out of college or even with adults. And we ask ourselves this question all the time. How do I get closer to God? How do I get closer to God? It's a good question. How do I hear God more? How do I know the path that he's calling me to? How do I know the plan of God? How do I know the purpose of God? How do I know that I'm loving God to the best of my ability? How do I get closer to God? And we treat this as if uh, we, we, we ask this question and then we come up with a whole set of things that we need to accomplish in order for that to happen. So we'll do things like this. We'll pray harder. We'll pray longer. We'll pray more frequently. We'll pray bigger prayers. And we'll pray more often. Or we'll attend church services or, or worship events. Or we'll even start reading scripture more. We'll start memorizing scripture and attempt to get closer to God. And here's the thing. Those things are necessary. They're important. They're valuable. And without them, it's extremely difficult to, uh, to follow God. However... If we are doing and accomplishing all of those things, but at the same time, ignoring the people in our lives who need love, Jesus says we're missing the whole point. He says we're missing the whole point. Jesus is trying to move us from a vertical relationship with God where all I am concerned about is how do I get closer? What do I have to do to climb this ladder to get closer to God? Where I, what do I have to achieve? What do I have to do so I'm somehow at the same level with where God is going to be? He's moving us from this, this vertical relationship with him. When he is telling us that the way that you get closer to him is by loving your neighbor. So how do I love God with all of my heart, with all of my soul, and with all of my mind? How do I love God? And the answer is by loving my neighbor. The answer is by loving my neighbor. God's love requires, whoops, that's not what I wanted. God's love requires requires us to love our neighbor. And it's not an option. You, you don't get to pick either or. I, well, I don't really like this person, so I, I won't love them, but I love Jesus. God's love requires us to love our neighbor. So Jesus is now setting up a new gauge as to how we go about our faith, Right? He's setting up a new gauge as to what we want to do or how we're supposed to do it, what's right and wrong, what's pleasing to him and, and what's not. He's setting up this new way of how we are supposed to live and think about faith. He's redirecting our hearts and our minds and how we are supposed to act, how we're supposed to think, what we're supposed to believe. And the question we're left asking is, what am I supposed to do? How do I know what is right and what is wrong? How do I know where God wants me to go? What decisions he wants me to make? And I think the question that Jesus is trying to get us to ask ourselves is, what would the action of loving my neighbor require me to do? What would the action of loving my neighbor require me to do? And what do I mean by that? We don't believe, we don't believe I, uh, most of us would be all in agreement here, that we don't believe that lying is a good thing to do, right? Like, it, it's hurtful to lie. It's not a right thing to lie to people, right? But why do we believe that? Well, because the Bible tells us to, right? Well, why? My, uh, this is, uh, as you already saw here, this is my nephew Tanner. Um, he is three years old. He'll turn four in about a week. Um, and one thing about Tanner, as you can see on the picture on the right, he loves basketball, 
loves basketball. And Stephen Curry is his favorite basketball player of all time. Uh, he's a little bit of a bandwagoner. I don't know what his deal is, but he's three, so I'll cut him some slack. But he loves Stephen Curry. And this kid, for hours on end, will shoot basketballs in his little tykes hoop at, our, at, my, at my parents' house and at his home. He just shoots over and over and over again. And because he loves it so much, he doesn't want to do anything else. So he does this thing right now where his mom will go up to him and say, hey, Tanner, it's time to go to bed. And he'll go, what? And he heard, and he knew exactly what she said, but he's trying to pretend like he didn't hear her. And for whatever reason, he believes that if, if he didn't hear her, then he doesn't have to go to bed. But so he does this thing with a lot of things. Tanner, you got to do this. What, 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 what? And he tries to pretend like he didn't hear because he just wants to play basketball. But Tanner also just came out of a phase where he asks another question, another one-word question. Does anyone know what toddlers usually say at that age? Why? 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 I hate this question because usually there's not a good reason for a lot of things we tell this kid to do. Tanner, go do this. Why? That's a good question. I don't know why. <laughs> Why, why, why? So we'll tell him, Tanner, you got to go to bed. Why? Tanner, you gotta, we're going to the store now. Why? Tanner, you got to eat your broccoli. Why? I don't know why. Nobody knows why we don't eat or why we eat broccoli. God doesn't know why we eat broccoli, but he asks why over and over and over again. Why, why, why? So we come to these, these parts in our faith when we're asking our question, uh, these questions, why? Why is this not okay for me to do? Why is this wrong? Why is this right? And here's a, a way that I, I feel like Jesus is trying to redirect our hearts and redirect our minds into saying, here's, here's this, lying dishonors the person that we're, that we're lying to, right? It dishonors the person we're lying to. It communicates that protecting me is more important than protecting you. And it's saying that you are not worth the truth. But we believe that God honored us when he sent his son for us. So why should I be able to dishonor one, someone that God loves? Also, Jesus dying for my sin was a declaration of my worth. So why am I able to declare someone worthless when God has made them, gave them worth through Jesus? So ultimately, it comes down to God deeply loves those people. So loving my neighbor requires me not to lie to them. Loving my neighbor requires me not to lie to them because of what Jesus has did on the cross. So ultimately, it comes down to what Jesus has done. And the same is true for so many other things. Pornography, selfishness, greed, all of these things, we decide that these things have, are damaging our relationships with our spouses, with our friends, with our coworkers. They're damaging us and they're damaging the people around us. So loving my neighbor requires me to stay away from those things. Because it is impossible to love God without loving our neighbor. Because loving God requires loving our neighbor. And here's why this is so important. We do not have time to live a faith that is simply based off following a ladder to get closer to God by rules. We do not have time to live a faith that's all about me getting everything right, following these rules so I can approach God. Jesus is asking me, what does loving my neighbor require me to do? Because here's the deal. When we start asking that question, not only do we stop doing the things that are hurtful to other people, but we, we begin to love in a sacrificial way that makes a deep impact in the lives of many. When we allow ourselves to ask the question, what does loving my neighbor require me to do? Because here's the deal. We live in a broken world. I don't have to tell you that. You, you know, you turn on the news that you know that we live in a broken world and we live in a broken world that needs the love of God. And a faith that is solely based on what can I do to get closer to God not only isn't helpful to us, but it destroys the people around us. Jesus is challenging us to think, what does loving my neighbor require me to do? Loving God requires loving your neighbor.
Loving God requires loving our neighbor. At the end of this uh, conversation that Jesus had with this lawyer, um, this is recorded in Luke, it's not in Matthew, but uh, this lawyer tries to justify himself. He's a little embarrassed that Jesus just, just roasted him in front of everybody. And he, he's trying to justify himself. And, he, and he's starting to catch on a little bit to what Jesus is saying here. He's like, wait, wait, wait a minute here. Well, who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? Because here's the deal. It is really easy to love the people that love us back. It is really, really easy to love the people who are kind to us, who love us, who give to us, who treat us well. It is a lot more difficult to love the people who don't love us back. So this, this guy, he starts to pick up on this. And he goes, wait a minute, Jesus, what are you saying here? Who's my neighbor? Let's get this straight here. And Jesus tells him of the story of the Good Samaritan. In the story of the Good Samaritan, uh, there's this Jewish man who's walking down a, a road, and he gets robbed, mugged, and beaten on the side of the road, and he's left there to die. And everybody who sees him dying on the side of the road walks past him. They walk past him over and over and over again until one man, a Samaritan man, sees him. And the thing you have to know, Jewish people and Samaritan people at this time not only didn't like each other, they hated each other. You didn't talk to them. You didn't go near them. You especially didn't help them. They were natural enemies. But the Samaritan saw this Jewish man in need, and he picked him up, put him on his donkey, brought him to the inn, and paid for his medical expenses for food and for him to get better, to get back up on his feet. And he loved him. And Jesus looks at this lawyer that he's talking to, and he says, he is your neighbor. Jesus is redefining who we are supposed to love. He's saying that your neighbor ranges from everybody, from your, your spouse to your family to your coworkers, to the very person that you like the least. To the person who's rude to you, who's nasty to you, or get this, your neighbor is also the person who thinks differently about you in politics or religion. Jesus says, he is your neighbor. And that in order to love God, we must love those people. Now, about, I don't know about you, if you're like me, if you've ever tried to love someone who's been nasty or mean to you, it is a hard thing to do. It is difficult. That's a tall task. There is no way I ever have the strength to do that. I try, I mess up, and I start being mean to them again, or I, I act out in a way that I shouldn't have. It's a difficult thing, and you find that if you've ever tried to do this, the more and more you try to love someone who's mean to you, if you're relying on what you can do and how good you can be and how much better you can be, is that you fail every single time. So it can be easy at this point to fall into the trap again of trying to climb this ladder or this set of rules to say, I need to be better, I need to be wiser, I need to be stronger in order to love these people because here's the deal. I'm afraid that if I don't love these people that I'm not loving God, okay, so does God really love me then? And it can be easy to fall back into, let me get stronger, let me get better, let me get wiser, let me uh, have more strength to go on and to love these people. But what you find is that you fail Every single time. But here's the good news. Jesus didn't just spend all of his time here on earth arguing with boring religious leaders. At the end of Jesus' ministry, he went to the cross, and on the cross he was nailed and he died there, and he took our sin, our guilt, and our shame, and our death, and he took that on the cross with him. And he took the punishment that we deserved, and he died. But he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose from the grave. And he defeated sin, and he defeated death. And he says, if you believe in me, you can receive forgiveness, healing, hope, a future, a purpose. And I will live inside of you. So Jesus goes to the cross and he dies for someone who is an active enemy. It is a story of God loving his enemy. Or as Jesus would say, loving his neighbor.
So what we do when we have these instances where we're, where we're struggling with loving people who are not loving us back, we have to remind ourselves time and time and time again of the truth of the gospel, of the truth of what Jesus did on the cross and how we were actively opposed and an enemy of God, but yet he still died for us and gave us hope and life and forgiveness. And when we think of everything that God has done in our lives, how can we then not love the people that God loves? And we don't have to do that on our own. God promises that if we believe in him, our, the Holy Spirit will come inside of us and give us strength and give us wisdom, give his supernatural power to love the people that we could not love on our own. But we have to be reminded time and time again of the truth of what Jesus has done on the cross for us. Because here's the deal. Loving God requires us to love our neighbor. Loving God requires us to love our neighbor. Let's bow our head and, and pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we're, we're grateful for what you've done on the cross. We were enemies to you. We were outwardly opposed to you. We did nothing to deserve being right with you, but God, you sent your son and you died in our place. And we know that if we just give our hearts to you, if we just trust in you, we can receive that forgiveness. We can receive your spirit. We can receive your strength, but nothing out of, the, uh, of what we can do, none of our goodness was ever good enough. We couldn't earn it. We can't earn it. God, it's all because of your grace and what you have done for us. And we want to live in that power. We want to be reminded of that strength and of that power. So if you're um, here and you're struggling at this point of time with loving someone who is not loving you back, maybe it's a spouse in your, in your household. Maybe it's been years of having a spouse who you don't feel like loves you back. So it's really, really difficult to love this person again. Maybe it's a boss or a coworker who's belittling or, or, or mean or angry or gets upset quickly. Maybe it's a family member has, who has uh, decided to make terrible decisions in their life and it's led them down a path you're, you can't follow them down, but you feel like every time you try to reach out to them, they turn away or they, or they look away from you. Jesus is, is calling us to remember time and time again what he has done for us, how he has loved us when we didn't deserve it, and then to allow our hearts to be open to the Holy Spirit working inside of us to, day at a time, chisel away the hardness so we're able to love those people. Maybe you're here, you're not on board with this whole Jesus thing yet. You're not convinced yet. You don't, you don't think it's for you yet. The greatest thing about... Uh, us loving God and loving our neighbors, we don't do this out of our own power. We're able to do this because God first loved us. And I think Jesus wants you to know if you're not on board with Jesus yet, he looks at you and he loves you. People say all the time, you don't know what I've done. God couldn't love me. I don't know what you've done, but God did and he still died for you. And he doesn't just love you as a collective group of people. He loves you as an individual. Even now you may be discounting yourself out of that statement, but I'm telling you it's true. But you don't have to take my word for it. God is inviting you to open your heart to him and you don't have to be good enough to get right with God. You don't have to follow the rules to get good with God. All you have to do is say, Jesus, will you take my heart? Will you take my life? Will you forgive me of every failure I've ever made? And he forgives, he gives hope, he breathes life and he gives you a purpose and he says you are a child of God. And he begins to transform you and he begins to move you in a way, not where we're just simply following the rules, but we begin to live a life that is loving our neighbor, that is pleasing to God. He loves you. Dear Jesus, we're grateful for what you're doing. God, give us the strength to love those who are unlovable. 
God, give us the strength to be open to what you're doing. Praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.